When you are finished, when you are done, yes. could you please keep it? Don't leave it at the Okay. Yeah. No problem. Has it started? Yes. Will you be in the I don't think it's the projector, I think it's the projector. Uh, it's been on for quite a while, they turned it on. Hi. The projector is no longer on. Yeah. Well, there's still some lights in the So, anything you can do to alleviate that situation. I think I'll start without a projection. Um, could we close the door? Uh, it's, there's a door stop. Just to give it a sense of. All right, we're all in this room. I'm very excited to see you all here today um, and uh, for the ecosystem of community action. Now, this is an abstract that I sent in approximately eight months ago to the conference organizers <laughs> um, in the full flush of enthusiasm of having joined this research project that I work on. Some of the results are actually on the tables in front of you. Um, and uh, I promised a lot in that description um, and I think quite a few are here because of that promise, the promise of describing all these different animals and types of community-based initiatives to you. I probably won't be able to deliver quite on that promise. But I'll do my best, and we can probably start thinking and exploring that concept of the different species of transition animals that there are. How many of you are familiar with the transition animal concept? No. No, okay. Um, yes. Uh, Let's, let's start where I was going to start, which was um, my actual plan. Hello. Hi, sorry. Please join in. Hey, it's good. Ah, something's working. If you at any point have any questions, or are speaking too quickly, um, or uh, there are any points that you that are just unclear, please raise your hand and say so immediately. Because if you don't understand something, it's quite likely that other people in the room have not understood it as well, and I haven't communicated clearly. When you're a musician, you actually, um, I play music sometimes, traditional folk music, um, and when you're performing, you often say, sound man is God, basically. <laughs> so, uh, or the tech guy is God. That's kind of the situation. 
situation we've got now. Yeah. I suggest that you sing while we wait for him. We could sing, but he's on the phone and that might interrupt him. <laughs> I think I'll do this without I'll do this without slides. I didn't have that many slides. I'll just have to adapt what I was going to do. Yes. How's that? How's that? I'll turn the laptop around. Yeah. That's the title slide. <laughs> the ecosystem of community action. There's a there's a word cloud in the middle with um, a whole bunch of different ways of describing community-based action for sustainability. You've got words like transition towns, which some of you may be familiar with. You've got um, I can't read this. Eco congregations, community land ownership, community bike workshops, community gardens, swapping networks, eco villages, skill sharing, grassroots development, um, development trusts, inter intentional communities, free cycle, energy cooperatives, uh, community empowerment, car sharing, food food savers networks, um, community supported agriculture. That's ecosystem that I'm going to try to talk about today. But first, uh, did that switch slides? No, the same one. You can oh, a little bit closer to you. Page down. Oh, should I move it back a bit? It's easier for you to. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll start. Here's an outline of the session. I'll start with an introduction and some and setting the scene. I'm sorry, I really don't have, <laughs> I don't have any room. I already have ten more people than I should have in this room. Um, and then I'll present the test project, which is a research project that I'm working on in Aberdeen. Um, and, but it's an EU research project. There's more information about it here. Um, I'll discuss some of the challenges that we faced in the work. Um, I'll present the data that we've collected and how we've collected it to kind of give you an insight into how um, how what's in front of you has come to be. And then we'll pl probably play around with the data together. So this is what we've got. We've got these all these little mini descriptions. If you don't have one, please pass them, pass them on, pass them around, just so you can have an idea of the kind of groups that I'm going to be talking about. And if you get bored while I'm speaking, you can examine them. So we'll, I'll have a few ideas about how we can play around with that data. And then we'll try to think of ideas of how we can make that useful for the permaculture movement and make this kind of research useful for the permaculture movement. So I'll start with me. No, I'll start with you. Just a, a brief reflection point. Why are you at this session? What is it that attracted you about this session? What yields are you hoping to get from spending your time one and a half hours here with me today? Um, and I'd just like you to think about that just so that you're ready for what might happen and just so you have an idea of, of what you want to get out of it. That usually helps. You probably won't get out of it what you want to. Is there anyone who wants to? Uh, <laughs> is there anyone who wants to share? I'll just say I wanted to understand the transition pro process, and if there's an opportunity for me to get involved in helping the transition, that's what I'd like to get into. Okay. How to do that? 
response that I know of um, to the predicament of the 21st century. It's not a challenge, it's not a problem. Those things either have solutions or ways of rising above them and you come out stronger on the other side. What I see is a predicament. It's a fact of life. It's going to happen to us. These things are happening in the world and they're, they're shaping the world that we're going into. I can discuss that more later, but permaculture seems to be the only approach which gives me a hopeful way of dealing with the future of energy descent. That's what brought me into permaculture and that's what brought me here today. I studied sustainable development at the University of St. Andrews, um, which is an interdisciplinary degree at a very old university in, in Scotland. Um, and during my studies, I got involved with the transition group at the University of St. Andrews. So that's based on the transition towns model. Are people familiar with the transition towns movement? Yes, yes. yes to some extent. To some extent. Okay, good. Um, so I coordinated that group. I then graduated 
um, as all students tend to do. And uh, my next step was to go to Ireland and, and to start an eight-month permaculture course there um, in Kinsale. Uh, but one month after starting that course, uh, I got an offer of a job to be a research assistant on a European project studying community-based transitions towards a sustainable future. That's not something you can turn down. <laughs> I hope you'll understand that. So what I'm here to do today is to kind of talk about that project, um, present the test project, present my work, and see whether this work can be useful, or how it can be useful, to a permaculture movement that's growing in awareness, growing in self-awareness, seeing itself as an actor in the world. The test project is called, is called us because it stands for Towards European Societal Sustainability, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's, it's um, in typical EU speak. It's about researching the impacts of grassroots community-based initiatives on greenhouse gas emissions reductions, as well as their broader economic, social, political, technological, and environmental impacts. We are also researching what makes initiatives successful and how they grow to determine how policy could encourage the further development of such activities across the EU. It's a very ambitious remit. It's basically trying to study all these community-based initiatives for sustainability across Europe, figure out what their impact is, and figure out how policy could um, <coughs> be improved to support such initiatives. That's the hope, anyway. It's an EU-funded project, uh, which m by definition means that there are eight partner institutions involved from across the EU, research institutions. Um, from six countries. So we've got people from Italy, Rome in Italy, we've got people in Finland, we've got people in Scotland, Romania, Germany and Catalonia. Um, and those are the six countries, so some of them have two institutions within them. Um, and needless to say, these institutions have different motivations for being involved in a project like this different aspirations for the future, different ways of understanding what this research is about. But nevertheless, they managed to come up with a com common kind of way of, of doing this research, way of trying to get to grips and trying to understand what was going on in Europe. They started they said, right, th this diagram kind of explains it. Unfortunately, I don't have it up here. I could draw it as well. It starts with an inventory, the ambition to kind of map all of these things that are going on, all of these community-based initiatives. The next step would then be to analyze their impact in some kind of numerical way, but also to do kind of interviews with them to kind of understand how they grow, what their history is, what their aspirations are, and so on. The fourth step is then to integrate all of this data into policy-relevant knowledge that can be communicated in some way. Encompassing all of this <laughs> is the communication aspect, so trying to communicate with people and trying to explain how it, uh, how it works and dissemination of, the, of these results. I was involved um, by the time I got involved the inventory had happened they had gone through that process and I had been hired to help with this numerical impact assessment and to help to help with the integration work, um, as well as to help with the stakeholder engagement stuff because of my background. I worked on some of the inventory work and did a report for the Scottish Government on the community-based initiatives for sustainability that were happening in and around the Aberdeen region, and I can talk more about that later.
discuss the challenges of the work. Basically, what we're dealing with when we're talking about groups of people that come together to make their world a better place is not a monoculture. It's an ecosystem. It's hugely diverse. These groups are shaped by their context, by their aspirations, by their histories, by their, even their language, their way of thinking. Um, and I've put the word cloud up there that I started the session with again. Which means that in each country and within each partner institution, there are a whole bunch of different understandings of what, what it was we were going to do and what it was we were actually studying and how to actually go about studying and who we would be engaging with. But the project had been funded, so they decided to rise above that difficulty and accept it as a fact of EU research, which it often is. I mean, working across the EU is incredibly difficult and complex. So they um, test the project team called them Community-Based Initiatives for Sustainability. And then they abbreviated that again and called them CBIs. So we have this term, CBI, that we throw around um, and almost take for granted now. We're working with CBIs. Um, Can you spell that for those of us who can't hear one? Yes, so Community-Based Initiatives, C-B-I, Charlie B. Beta India. Um, and that's what we've started throwing around as, as this term of what we're studying. But, and this is where I want to start a small discussion, is whether there actually is such a movement. In, in your experience, who, who here is from Europe? Europe. Yeah, yeah, based in Europe. Who here is not based in Europe? <laughs> What's that? Well, oh, UK. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, that's please. That's <laughs> 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 Let's not get political about yeah. this. <laughs> no, <laughs> the UK is not part of any other continent except Europe. <laughs> Cyprus is, is a bit of on the edge there, but... Um, we are part of Europe. Yeah, yes. there you go. Excellent. <laughs> I think Cy Cyprus is more of a grey zone than the UK is. Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if you think that there is a there is such a movement happening in the world around you. Are there groups of people coming together in a grassroots way to start initiatives? For sustainability, turn to your and turn to someone next to you, pair up, and um, <laughs> and then think about these other questions. You might want to think about these other questions. questions. If so, are there more accurate names? I'm sorry, I, I asked you to turn to the person next to you before telling you the rest of the thing. There's more to it. Thumb. If so, are there more accurate names for it? Can it be defined? If not, why not? How would you go about defining that movement? How would you say what's in and what's out? What's typical? What's the kind of archetype that you're dealing with? What's the kind of typical group that you're dealing with? What's the stereotype, even, if you want to push it that far? What would you parody? Um, if you're parodying that movement, what would you satirize? Um, yeah, go. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting.
It's amazing. It's just amazing. You get people who are all interested in the same thing, and you put them in a room, and you get them to talk. It's great. I don't, I don't have to do a thing. And I thought that since you're talking so well, and you've probably discussed quite a few of the answers to the question, would it be possible for you to kind of move round so that you're talking to someone else um, and you can share what the, what the two of you were talking about and maybe um, get, get a couple of new insights before we try to bring it together as a group. So try to move around the room or meet someone new or just turn it to the other side.
Did anyone come up with any? No more question. Oh, has it gone? Oh, thank you. Has it, did anyone come up with any answers? Is there a unified kind of movement? Nope. Um, <laughs> Not at all. Um, you, okay. That's quite a specific example. Sorry. What did you say? The Global Eco Village Network is a network of eco villages which has a global reach. <laughs> and uh, um, so, so, transition towns. Yeah, transition towns. <laughs> permaculture, as a as an example, there there are co-housing. What's that? Co-housing. Co-housing does exist and has a kind of umbrella organisation, does it? Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. they're, they're yeah. Mr. Pollitt point in his lecture earlier in the morning, where he was uh, brought up the point which is very important, I think, is the relationship between modern science, but the old pre-industrial style of farming, how the two of those could become very important together. Do you see that as a kind of movement, as, as a series of initiatives happening across the world? Agroecology. Agroecology yeah. as a movement. We need science. I yes. mean, imagine the farmers in the 16th or the 15th or the 14th century, if they were aware of ergot. Yeah. Uh, we probably would have had much fewer wars. Yeah. You know? I mean, the science is like a, a wonderful thing in regard to production, but at the same time, it, it often does not get balanced with sort of the holistic mentality that's prevalent within groups such as this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Growing Hope is the um, overall initiative I see. We've got a culture which is is swinging between denial and despair. Mm. And what we need is to gather up all these hopeful initiatives into a pattern which is big enough for people to recognize as an alternative to denial and despair. Well, I think there's an overall movement but which is not unified, not formally. Uh, which makes me think of Paul Hogan and Blessed and Rest, who talks about the movement without a name. And he actually talked about what's going on. Because we have com everyone wants their community garden now, and more and more people want to buy their food straight from the farmer. And it's a movement to me, but which is not formally structured. It's like this wave, just like rippling, and brrr, it's, it's, it's getting bigger. Oh, yes. Movement there, without a name. Is there a structure uh, the, the food growing which, which connects farmers with consumers and you get into family groups of like 20 different schools? That's so many yeah. ones. Yeah. That's yeah. one yeah. of the ones, yeah. but it's yeah. not the only one. That That's is, uh, yeah. more like in France, it's called AMA, yes. yeah. Association Mutuelle pour la Culture Paysanne. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. is not the only one. We have green baskets in our city, we have people staying in the countryside close to the countryside who are delivering green baskets to the city without being a producer and they're just facilitating the, the network. But, but uh, the, the, it's, it's an ecosystem. Yeah. Any exactly. kind of animal that could exist in, ecos in that ecosystem will, will pop up or sprout up because they have the niche. Mm -hmm. So it's about diversity, I think, yeah. in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. you don't want a big organization because otherwise you're back into the system we are having which is working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Such an organization can't adapt to local needs as much, so you, know, you want to be more um, autonomous. Mm -hmm. Communal. 
in, yeah. in France, I uh, meet a lot of people, and I think the problem is everyone wants to create his own organization, his new model, want to be, uh, want to save humanity, and they don't uh, look if there is an uh, existing community, yes. existing system w which are working. And I think it's really, really, really a big problem, which is a sort of a individualist model. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we want to be better than you and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Could I raise the counterexample of permaculture, which has all brought it and brought us all here? Yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, it's a valid point, and I do think there is something about fragmentation and, and balkanization of of different ways of thinking about transition, and everyone has their new idea. But there is a there is a sense there is a value in large movements that do bring people together as well. I'll I'll take a couple, uh, two, three more points. But this, we were not discussing this, but when I lived in Bristol, I lived there for 20 years before I moved back to Iceland, one of my research assistants generated a website called EcoJam, which is still up and running 10 years later, and links together all the green and community thinkers in Bristol. And now there are EcoJams in other cities too. So it's possible to plug into that sort of a system for those who are interested in linking people together. Mm -hmm. How do you spell it? Eco yeah. well, uh, Jam. Eco Jam. Eco Jam. Sorry, we'll take it. Just this group here alone can spread it on much bigger than it already is. <laughs> so e e c o e c o j a m dot org. In the Netherlands, we'll we the have uh, the younger generations, what I see is growing, they call themselves uh, the hashtag community. And it's just like what you see in the whole world, because what is sustainability is about life. Um, they um, connect just like in the internet, just for a small period together, then they split and they s uh, s uh, come together again, they split and then sometimes they work for two or three weeks uh, in a garden together, then they split again and some people are going to build and after a while they go on traveling because they want to connect with other people and these younger generations are very creative, very flexible and they know everybody. <laughs> so it's really amazing how they, because I feel very old when I speak to these youngest, and um, it's been really amazing. And I think it's also because I really do wonder how you can make a study of this, because in the city I live with 100,000 people, and I can't even count all the projects are running over there in all the parts about sustainability. So how can you even count it? Does everyone know consensus hands? It's the, uh, if you agree, <laughs> you disagree. <laughs> so, um, could, we have, could we have a sense of agreement or disagreement with that huge diversity? Yeah, yeah. It's a good problem. It's a good problem. There's yeah. so much going on. Yes. I think what's more important is that all individuals just grab onto something of the same. Although I totally sympathize with this man's point about other people trying, everybody's trying to start a new thing. And we, you know, the, everyone's looking for new energy too, to, to, to bolster that thing. Yeah, so the, the two I'd, like to, I'd like to parallels, actually, you know? give you an idea of how Tess approached this. And to give you an idea, because, I mean, a lot of people in Tess knew that this diversity existed. And some of them very quickly found out that this diversity existed. And um, they still wanted to study something. They'd been given money by the European Commission to study something <laughs> and to come up with policy relevant knowledge, which would hopefully um, inform EU policy, which then informs national policy. Um, not in a direct correlation, always, but um, uh, so. I'll briefly talk you through um, how we collected data, what we collected, and then I'll talk about these identity cards that I've kind of laid out everywhere, and we might play around with those a bit just to give you an idea of a, a concrete example of this European ecosystem of community action. Present the collected data. They took a while to come up with a basic definition, um, and you'll notice, I'll read it out, but you'll notice that there are only three points in bold 
They are initiated and managed by communities. They have been up and running for at least one year. And then they added, they operate within at least one of the following four domains, food, transport, energy, and waste. And I think they used those because they felt those to be the environmentally relevant domains of human activity. It also somehow gave them a limit. But the interesting thing in the definition that they came up with is um, all the maybes. So they may have received public money, but not necessarily. They may be for non-profit as well as for profit, but their overall objectives should serve the community. They can be local in a city or in the countryside. The focus is on the initiatives and not their spatial geographical location. So basically... They're all free and open door. It's a lowest common denominator approach. This is because the consensus was needed within this research group to actually move forward and study something without endlessly debating what it was they were going to study. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> I mean, we've just started the discussion just now about what it is you're going to study. Put yourself in those shoes, trying to generate knowledge. We're at a conference. A conference is an academic event. Um, so that's the kind of thinking we want to try today. They then agreed on a snowballing mechanism by which the individual research partners would phone up initiatives that they knew of and ask them to pass them on to other initiatives within their area and kind of give them three names and, and thus would kind of get a grassroots way of spreading into this or understanding this community action network. I see some of you nodding. It, it's quite, um, it is quite a useful way of approaching a field that you don't know much about. It's not a top-down way. We didn't, we didn't go to the transition network. We didn't go to the permaculture association. We didn't go to um, global eco-village network or Ecolease, which is the European network of networks. They didn't go to them either. Um, they started instead from, from the bottom up. Um, so they approached 618 initiatives. Now there are some exclusion criteria. Um, obviously refusal to participate and answer the questions. Um, obviously no response. A lot of these groups simply didn't respond. The email address was no longer active or the phone number was no longer active. Um, too far from the study region. So that's a practical issue in that um, we couldn't actually get there to study them. Um, in Finland, they went all over Finland and seemed to consider a six-hour flight to a, a remote area to actually meet an initiative, a normal occurrence, which was interesting. Um, and too recently started. So if they, if they had started too recently, they, they had a criteria that they should be over one year old. And that was to be able to see if they had had an impact, the focus of the project being on impact. Yes? Um, so if I understood you choose organization, independent uh, organization, because of, for example, uh, you were speaking about AMA in France, mm -hmm. which uh, is a network between uh, um, people yeah. uh, to buy food from producers. Yeah. So I think it's with all this criteria. Yeah. And we, we have maybe hundreds of, of that. Yeah, so yeah. How so can you only reach 680? What they did is they directly went to the groups active in their area, so the people active in their area, so the actual AMAP group, for example, and called them up rather than the central organization, um, and asked them for direct contact, the people that they knew personally, that they had direct contact with, rather than the groups that were part of the same umbrella organization. It's a different approach. I mean, another approach would have been to go to all of these network groups, but this is what they chose to do. And in the end, they got 269. So remember, they approached 618 initiatives, and they got 269 that actually filled out this first survey um, across Europe. Which first survey? But this, um, so that who, uh, there were some questions that they, that they had to answer in addition to whether they knew other people. So basic information like the name, the age of the group, how many people were involved, that kind of thing, what they did. 
what then happened is um, that this snowball sample was then sampled again for impact analysis. Because the whole point of the project was to see whether you could measure the impact, this collective impact of these groups across the EU. But to measure, to meaningfully report on the impact, you need to assume that the sample you choose somehow represents the wider body. Otherwise, you'd have to sample every single, every single group and analyze every single group. So they, they tried this disproportionate stratified random sampling, which is great. It's a way of... Um, they wanted this, their sample to equally represent the six countries and the four domains of activity they'd chosen, so food, energy, transport, and waste. And within those kind of criteria, that matrix, they wanted to kind of statistically represent this population that they had chosen of only 269 initiatives. Um, and with those groups, we've, we've done a detailed questionnaire. And the result of that questionnaire, or the partial result, we haven't finished working through this data yet, is in front of you, all of these different groups. And to be honest, I have summarized it drastically. It was a long questionnaire. So that's what all these identity cards are about. Yes? Could you tell, could you tell us, maybe you'll get to this, I don't know, but what is an example of an impact? You said we're looking at impacts like waste and food or whatever, right? But what do you mean, what, what kind of an impact would you Improvement in food production would be the impact? Or more people will be fed because of this initiative? Or these initiatives? What's your impact that you're measuring? It's extremely saying? broad. <laughs> <laughs> and hence, hence why this questionnaire long. was so long. Yeah. Um, I didn't develop the questionnaire, I was yeah. given the questionnaire. This is the way these EU that. projects work. It's, I'm giving this partially just so you understand the EU research process, just because of the uh, complexities involved. Um, but we, we went through and asked them how many members they had, how many people they had involved, what kinds of yeah, but that's the baseline of culture, yeah. right? That's what kind of activities they had done. Every single group had a different aim and was trying to do different things. But what was it? Okay, but the impact that you're measuring is what? Like more community involvement? Is that your impact? Yeah. Um, okay, so the, in these people's personal lives? Was that the impact? All of it. Well, no, well, the, I mean, and yes, I there is a struggle, but the, the, the motivation, I think, of understanding impact was greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, okay. Um, right now you started with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yeah. But there are two different visions. The Germans were very focused on measuring greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Right. And um, they're dead keen on this whole calculator, carbon calculator things. And, right transforming everything into numbers. The Italians were far more keen on a whole massive set of indicators. So social bridging capital, bonding capital, social uh, community empowerment, economic impact, so how much money was being pumped into the community, how much uh, local employment was being created. You had environmental impacts, you had technological impacts. What kind of innovations were these groups coming up with? Um, you had uh, political impacts. What kind of political impacts were these groups having? It's extremely ambitious. Um, in my opinion, slightly over ambitious. Um, but we now have this data to some extent about 52 initiatives. That's pretty impressive. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, did you, did the research look at? What kind of legal models they were using? Yes, that Both too. Formal, informal, uh, hierarchical, you know, yeah, yeah. all those kinds of things. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the challenge, again, with studying something at such an aggregated level, at the EU level, was that you're limited to questions like how participatory are your decision making methods on a scale of one to six? Yeah. Um, I mean, there was some detail involved. But, and that detail is kind of encapsulated in some of these paragraphs at the bottom. But there's paragraphs and paragraphs more of detail 
involved, and you somehow have to represent this data in a useful way. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to s summarize these different initiatives, these different animals in this big European ecosystem of community action that we have sampled. And I've made little identity cards. And the hope is that this is one way of presenting the data that doesn't lose the complexity, but also allows us to gain a vision of the whole. So what I wanted to do now is to actually test test that theory, test whether it actually is a good way of presenting the data. So um, what you've got in front of you are these identity cards. Pass them around. Um, there should be two per person, approximately. And have a read of the two that you've got. And see if you can imagine the kind of initiative that, that's involved. Are you from Romania? Yeah. And some of my friends are here on the table. Does everyone have two? Yes, we are. We are, we are actually passing. Oh, away. you're just like, passing them on. We just, we were way too curious, and we want to do them. Okay. <laughs> well, yes. I was actually going to get people to then share oh, okay. share the information. So, is anyone missing any? And those are the two that you'll need for the rest of this workshop. So you'll be responsible for the two that you've got in your hand. Place them in the right place. Yeah, there's 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 plenty here. No, 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 the data is not yet available. I mean, the data isn't fully clean. Yeah, only the names of the structures. the names of the structures, maybe? Names? Like you've got NGO, you've got structure, you've got uh, no, I mean, um, like a, a list of all these groups. Yeah. A list of all the groups. No, we don't even have that yet. Uh, working in an EU project, as I have come to find out, is extremely challenging. Uh, and people are always late with submitting information. So by the end of September, I'm hoping that we'll actually have a complete group of, of these initiatives. Did oh, that answer you're still your question? Looking, you're still looking for new We're still compiling all the data that the partners have collected. Okay. Um, that's, that's part of what I'm trying to communicate, is that this, these research processes take a huge amount of time, and the data we generate is what you're ha holding in your hands, um, and is... But simultaneously, this is the way in which data gets fed up into the European policy process somehow. So this is, this is as good as it gets, basically, in terms of understanding community action on a European level with the degree of coordination that's necessary to, to research across the EU. Ask the question, Petra. So do you think it is triply complicated because you're doing it over the EU and there are so many different cultures and mentalities. Would it be as tricky if you did the same thing just in one country? Because I mean it's still varied. I don't know. Um, some of you might be able to answer that question in your own heads. But I think that the challenge might exist within individual countries as well, but it's compounded by the fact that we're operating within the EU with so many different institution contexts and legal contexts and policy contexts um, and language barriers. Uh, some 
I, when I speak to my German grandparents, I have incredibly diffi incredible difficulty even translating the term community-based initiative. Um, community is a troubling term. Does everyone have two cards? You've got three. You've got four. If if you if you do want to leave, that's fine. I'm, I'm Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Other people have left as well, and to be honest, um, it's making the air slightly more breathable. <laughs> Uh, but you could spread spread out around the table. Okay, so I had a couple of ideas to, to help you understand. You've, you've understood the individual initiatives that you're holding in your hands. Yeah? You've, got a, you've had the time to read those. Um, what you could do now is maybe group them in terms of understanding maybe what happens in Finland what happens in Scotland, what happens in Germany, in Italy, in Romania. So if you could move the two cards that you have, um, and we'll have Finland here, as I said, Scotland here, we'll have Germany in that corner, we'll have Italy there, Romania and Spain in this corner. Catalonia is, is where you are. So some are sociologists, some are anthropologists, some are natural scientists, physicists uh, for the greenhouse gas stuff, some are um, so it's a huge variety of backgrounds and understandings of how to do this as well. Finland is over that way. But there's only five Romanian initiatives. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the next step that you might want to you, you might want to try is to go around the different countries and be a bit of a tourist. So have a look at what, what's going on and try to get a flavor of the different countries. And I suggest standing up um, to do so well, once, you've, once you've looked at the initiatives in a particular country. Okay. So the idea is trying, to, it is trying to get a feel for what's going on. Is this Germany? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is try to get a feel for what's going on across Europe and in the different countries. So right. try to, as you look at each country and as you move around from Scotland to Finland to Romania to Germany to Catalonia, try to see whether there is a flavor or a type of initiative oh. in that country, whether there is some kind of pole or possibly not. So. Looking for patterns. Looking for patterns, if there are any patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, you've only got three initiatives in Romania, so it's quite difficult. It's here. Romania is here. Where's Finland? Ah, just here. More for Finland. Okay. And I suggest once you've looked at one country, getting up and looking at another country. Is it because 
Is it because of the internet? You can just set up the same thing there it is without having to run and Stand up just so that the, the movement is a bit more dynamic in the room. Yes, I am like. Yes, stand up. I'd like to yeah, see that. I saw the machine like folded. You couldn't do anything about it. It's a little bit of a problem. It's a little bit of a problem. But it's a little bit of a problem. I can't. I wonder. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Has everyone has everyone been a tourist in in more than one country? I'm on the fish. Okay. <laughs> Have a look. I think what you might start to notice has anyone been able to to characterize any particular country? No. 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 I can't be able to compare. Finland. Well, everyone Finland. else got up. Did you see? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Finland, Finland seems I'm very interested in efficient, clean housing with uh, control of waste. Yeah. Finland has, Finland has a, and the people in Catalonia uh, seem very interested in fresh food that's easily available within a community context. I would, I would tend to agree with you no. from my experience of the data. Just from going through it and going through it and going through it. It's but very hard to put a finger on them, what those differences are. Well, I think climactic and traditional influences play a great part. But at the same time, if you sort of, like I started off in Italy, and the first few I looked at were all um, group purchasing to increase purchasing power. And then you look at other bits and it's different and you come, and you get a group and I wonder if it is because you started off with one organization and they of course know other organization of like-minded um, flavor and therefore you get this kind of setup where you go well this is all about energy yeah, because you only clicked into the energy network <laughs> it, that's the thing with this snapshot it really is a snapshot and because we, we use this snowball sampling approach it's very hard to tell what is 
local flavor and what is true difference? Um, or, or what is just due to the bias of having contacted a particular organization? So that's, that's the struggle of trying to understand a movement this broad um, at a European the, level. Some of the uh, projects tackle several different aspects mm. of the environment and social life. Yes. Some are focused on a, a, a narrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We could we could try looking at some some other kind of axes of difference, if you like. Yes. Um, so rather than grouping them by country, um, does anyone have any ideas of how we who, how we might try to group them? Well, food, food waste, energy, or food, yeah. housing, and waste. Food, energy, transport, waste, housing. Mm -hmm. Let's housing do you want the I found them the improvements. You could group them by number of beneficiaries too. Projects. I think it would yeah. be an interesting spectrum because you want to be worthy at one end and fun at the other end. Mm. <laughs> some of them seem some very high minded and some of them just seem like having a bit of fun really. Have you got them on a proper database? Yes. So you can sort them? I do have them so in the spreadsheet. Coding and sorting. Yes. Are you going yes. to give us a an email or web address so that we can follow what comes out of this project? Yes, absolutely. Before we finish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because um, this is as far as we've got with the data yes. so far. Yeah. And um, Partially, I just wanted to show you the data. I wanted to show you what was going on in each of these countries. Partially, I wanted to explain what, how research happens at an EU level, how people are trying to understand this ecosystem of community-based initiatives across the EU, and how they're trying to come to grips with it. Um, that's something that ought to be happening in these southern African countries. Well, I mean, I mean, do you know? What? Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to hear what. And do you do you know how much how much effort you're asking uh, the organisations to put uh, to give uh, into to participate? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's that's it something that I've impact. that I've been very aware of. Um, in 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 the, I mean, these people are hugely busy. Uh, especially in the Scottish initiatives that I've sampled, some of them are actually have funding from the government to implement the projects that they're running, um, and they don't have enough hours in the day. So they took three hours twice to speak to me and to tell me all of these facts, and that's that's the cost of a data set like this. Um, personally, I wonder whether a data set like this is even worth collecting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, maybe that's because I'm... It only a small fraction of, of what's there. Yeah. And the main thing is the people's willingness to, to actually participate. Yeah, a lot of people didn't have the time or didn't have the contacts. We, we left out a lot of informal organizations that didn't answer the phone. Mm. Uh, yeah, because you've got, uh, you know, some organizations are highly centralized, like one person can tell you everything. Uh, uh, and some of them, it would be like a bunch of people, nobody knows who's in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 been a it's been a challenge and it's been a learning journey. And I wanted to share some of that learning with you. Really. Have you found also, like for us in New Zealand, money from government or councils or any sort of structure basically doesn't exist anymore. And now it's the corporations. Sorry. Um, where we get our money from. So it's the funding model of oh, oh, accidents. Yeah. It's just more Yeah, that was an interesting point about the money because there is a lady yeah. in that movie you've mentioned and just off the cuff. One thing that does separate them all, the difference between volunteer and paid. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tremendous thing, because when an initiative starts, people as a group say, oh, it's volunteer, or if it's paid, that's two different mentalities from the, from the beginning. Yeah. And, and it's often a problem when you change from being a volunteer to having somebody <coughs> paid, Thank you. and how that affects the group. It completely ruins the organization sometimes. In one can person, do, can do. Is what, I, what I've seen in Let's Groups, they're very rarely funded, but 
Uh, once it's funded or one person's you know, getting paid to do the work, everybody else falls on that. It just ruins the project. And yet for us in the time bank system, they said the time banks that got fun, who have one person marketing and getting it out there and engaging people and so on, then the time banks work better than the time banks that just organically sort of... Yeah, but it's a funded model. The time bank is a funded model. No, it's not. We started with no money, nothing at all. Uh, well, I'm talking about the UK. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I found as well in my experience that um, the Transition University of St. Andrew's project, once we got funding to employ someone, was hugely successful. Just the sheer amount of stuff you can do, events one that you can put on, it. if yeah. one person is fully yeah. involved. What I wanted to point out, though, is the cooperative wow. approach to some of these things, or the collective approaches, in which they manage to, especially in, in Finland, they seem to have cracked something in terms of um, putting money into a cooperative and then contracting out to the members of the cooperative to do the work. Um, so it's, it, yeah, you don't have an employee as such. Every member of the cooperative is self-employed and they offer particular yeah. skills to the cooperative. You need fencing done, there's somebody that does great fencing. And, and that implies a certain level of organisation to it. Yeah, yeah, so people do have to participate and people do have to govern mm -hmm. something, but all of these initiatives have to be organised in some way. That's, yeah. that's, I, I guess that's a commonality uh, across the whole thing, is that they, <laughs> they are all, all organised. They, they've managed to come together as a group of people with a common purpose. When you've been looking at, the, looking at that, I was thinking the obvious thing with an ecosystem is that some, some species die out, don't they? And some, some become dominant. And will you be looking at how some, are some of these models are more robust and more successful and others are not going to look, even look at them over time, in other words? Part of the, part of the research has looked at um, kind of more detailed interviews with 14 initiatives. Um, I haven't put stars on them, but I could have, um, to see how they grew and um, what contributed to their success and how they became important, which uh, is an important thing to do, but I think we suffer from sample bias in that we can only sample the ones that still exist, and we can only sample the ones that have been successful. Um, I think there's a lot to learn as well from a lack of success or uh, non-existence or... You, you could yeah. track those down, couldn't you? Because everybody would know somebody who, the group that had folded. Or even yeah. in a group that folded and then moved into another group that was working. Yeah. Well, I've made lots of groups like this that have, well, a bit like this that have folded. Yeah. And then, um, there's lots, lots of learning from that. Yeah, I wonder if it's just part of the process, this kind of, you grow, you, you live, grow, die, and out of the ashes comes yeah. something new, and yeah. all the time you're building Fertile soil. I mean, that you could run away with that metaphor, but um, you can't push one. metaphors really too far. food chain Yeah. Yeah, I can see a really interesting research project looking at one community and how, as you say, groups come and go, and also uh, the relationships between the different groups mm -hmm. is really interesting, and how they relate to the local like authority. Yeah. So focusing on a particular area. Yeah, so looking at like, the ecosystem of. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, Tom, Tom Henfrey and I were talking about this yesterday, and he suggested that we can think of everything gardens, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a permaculture kind of principle, or it's a statement, rather, <laughs> uh, that just says that every, everything, every entity shapes its environment to then enable other entities to enter that environment in the same way that a tree growing creates habitat yeah. for, other, for other species. And he said particularly in Bristol, for example, 30, 40 years ago, or maybe further back, there was very little. But now you go into Bristol and you breathe permaculture in the air, you know, that you breathe kind of greenness in. Greenness kind of happens. Um, and expectations become expectations. Yeah, yeah. Which is a very important thing. And I'm up in Aberdeen. Uh, Aberdeen is the oil capital of Europe, and it feels barren at the moment, you know, and I'm what, really struggling. What, but sort of, what sort of towns uh, enable that to take place? Bristol is a town you can actually walk through. Yeah. Um, okay. 
But cause and effect is the good question. Yeah. Then. What, yeah. What, which came first? I mean, I, I think it's something about networking. And uh, when we were, we were discussing it earlier, it was, um, I think of it like a network of mycelium cells. It's under the you know, not quite in view, and it's how people connect to the, each other and the, you know, the projects pop up here. If it's a healthy mycelium, then uh, we've got a healthy network and projects can come and go and succeed and benefit each other and um, break that. I, mean, I, I work down in Plymouth, um, and since I started to in, in the mid-90s, I can see a huge difference of that networking um, and the the results of the networking really um, that has enabled a lot more projects to, to come into fruition. Mm -hmm. And then of course the other thing that's happening is that um, the councils are changing how they think of Plymouth um, and they're much more open to actually allowing people to have land and um, do projects than they were you know, even 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm sure so that's a big factor, factor. Yeah. The, 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 the economic the yeah. authorities. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that it's more economical for them to support community groups to take over a woodland or mm. what, uh, in the city. We've got a big mm. woodland. Uh, the Friends Group has successfully turned a no-go wood, basically, into a community project with orchards and wildflowers and it. And it's now used by the community, whereas you know, even five years ago it wasn't. Yeah, I mean that's a very interesting uh, dynamic that's happening in the UK at the moment and, and other countries um, and there's, I think it's worthwhile to share that there's actually a neoliberal kind of, uh, or critique of that idea that um, uh, it's, it's almost neoliberal in its approach to saying, well, um, yes, government should do less and people should do more for themselves and communities. Well, you've 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 kind of taken uh, people out of the equation, but you've replaced it with communities, and you say, well, communities should be doing more themselves, and it's kind of normalising that thing that people should be doing stuff for themselves. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad yeah. thing, but it's it's, it's, it's that's it's kind of tying like in. Loads of people are benefiting from it. Yeah, that couldn't tell us. They don't even know they're benefiting from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fresh air, the insects, yeah, yeah. the whole yeah. economy of the nature that's been improved by it. Yeah. But it's, it's also that thing about how does the community support those activists who are making it happen? Yeah. So they and don't I've, burn out, so the project doesn't burn out. Yeah. And I think it's very difficult in a big city like London because uh, activists are not relating to their boroughs. Yeah. You know, not, they don't even, most people, I do this in collecting names and addresses, most people do not know which borough they're in. When they fill in their name and address, they don't know which borough they're in. Yeah, I mean, we're focusing very much on the UK here. And the UK is unique in terms of the structure of its local government in Europe. Exactly. We have France is very interesting. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. All we have a mayor, which I think is genius. The lowest <laughs> level of, of local all government. Of France, every little village has its own mayor. Depending upon the mentality of the mayor, the village can be very, very green. What I care about? Yeah. 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 I mean, in, in the UK, the lowest level of government governs on average 70,000 people. In Scotland, it's 140,000 people at the lowest level of government. In most of the rest of Europe, it's somewhere between 5,000 and 15,000 on average. And that makes a huge difference in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, people just aren't relating. They, they, and it's not in the education system, they don't know who's in charge of what and how you make anything happen. They really don't know. And that's why they get off their own bum and do things themselves because they, they've despaired yeah. in, in governments. There just aren't the government structures for no. them to involve. No. And to involved. So do we know of or can we share communication systems because I think that is where the cracks lies. Mm -hmm. We are thinking for our town, how can we make a something where people can go, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and then I find out what is actually going on, and that, where everybody can update this. I mean, on Facebook we have sort of something created, but the majority of the, our town is not on Facebook. So how do you link the others who are not electronically savvy? Um, yeah, what, what I, I, no, I just wanted to share something because 
So I, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, well, what the Facebook thing is actually really useful. Uh, my town is actually quite exceptional. All right, and I don't say this to say it is like it's an exceptional little town that is extremely well organized. And two guys, right, two photographers in the town, went through and they documented. They actually took photographs of every single group in my town. All right, there's 3,500 people in my town. This is in North Wales. There were 180 different groups in this town. They put this out. This is like all of us. They put this in a book, a community book, actual book. They sell this book. Right? Anyway, I just thought that was it's just an alternative to putting people on Facebook. I just I thought it was absolutely a brilliant idea, and it gave you some idea of the the diverse, the rich tapestry of activities and people in this of the small amount of people, right? And how much was actually going on in that town? And we have a town, we do the internationalized Stedford, so we're, we're famous for bringing people in from all over the world to come to sing in Wales. It's like this is a big event that's been going on since um, the end of World War II. But that doesn't exclude, like that's our big showstopper thing, right? But you know, we've got the WI in there, you've got the, um, you've got, they even took the pictures of the fire, the volunteer fire people, firemen. They, they've got the, um, all the, the people that participate for the school groups, all the different, uh, the Friends of the Earth group, the everything, everything, the church groups, and it is such a rich. I, I mean, I was I was really impressed that that I lived in this little town and how rich and how interesting it was, and that we all have gotten together and we've done. We're now Chittislow certified, which is another like um, Chittislow is another like environmental certification. It's based on some a model of some village in, or community in, in Italy. And also, uh, we're a fair, tr fair trade town. So there are all these things. This is where about all the business owners got involved. Everybody's very much involved. And they all do little things, like there's a Flamboflin Preservation Society that stood up against the edge of town supermarket, and there's, right, and there's the Welsh groups, and there's, and everybody sort of, they're all there, and they're all sort of, sort of tangentially working together, and they're sort of getting stuff done, and, and it, 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 it's pretty amazing, because it's all behind the scenes, though. Not stuff that you actually just say. But I, I think, and I'm going to pull this to a close now, and you're definitely welcome to continue the discussion afterwards. But um, I think that's where telling the story comes into its own, and that's where efforts, even like this one, imperfect as it may be, um, telling the story is incredibly important. And telling the story and make, just making people feel that there is something happening. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Newsworthy stories. So make a book. <laughs> you can do that. I mean, it's just what was the name of your town? Flamlaughlin. L L A N G O L L E N. If you Google it. Thanks everyone for coming. Oh, uh, my, my, my contact details. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can keep in touch for people who are on this particular subject. <laughs> This is an interesting connection or something. Go around and photograph things and put them on your Facebook page. Places you want people to work on. Of course. Yeah. Get the young and ambitious fishing propaganda. No, I was not really checking. I knew that. Have a look at this. You may not want to turn on the official face of our project to the world and particularly to the European Union. So your mail Yes. Um, that was all on my last slide, which is not available. Um, I'll I'll open this up again. Joshua, because you're also one of those linkers, um, do you know for sure that IPC UK is making every presentation available on uh, Creative Commons? I don't I heard know. I've something, but I'm not sure. I I think they're video. I think they're supposed to be streaming it, but then if the thing was up there, it would be cool, but it would be not oh, really good. I'm sure yeah. that it's Oh, no, but grab some, grab one of anyone else. Out, yeah. All these PowerPoints, yeah. yeah. some wheel turning out. So, we don't have a team to really make those. So, I'm sure it will. My name's Chess Mechanic. I know, I was looking at your watch. Yeah, because otherwise, you're scrolling and you're not participating. 